Hello everybody, my name's Tank Runner, and welcome to another episode of Drawing Roulettes and World Building. Today, we're going to continue working on our project to turn famous YouTubers into D&D characters. Last episode, we worked on Unis Anis, Game Grumps, Jenna Marbles, and PewDiePie. I still like how these turned out, but that was over five months ago, and I think we can do a little better now. I'm sure you've seen the names in the title, it's probably why most of you are here, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. I've randomly selected a few YouTubers to draw, I'm going to pick a D&D class for them based on their personality or past experiences, and then I'm going to give them some lore so they all fit together in a fantasy setting that has little pieces of real life sprinkled in for inspiration. Same disclaimer as before, these are real people and I'm not going to pretend to know them personally. It's not my place to decide where the line is between a person and a character they play for my entertainment. That being said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So strap in because there's going to be a few, let's say, contentious figures in this video. So regardless of whether you're a fan of these people or you hate them, I'll just see everybody down in the comments later so you can all tell me how much of a piece of shit I am. I want to kick us off with a few updates and a brief recap on the lore. If you're not interested in that stuff and you just want to skip to the part with the new designs, here's a time code for that. All right, first off, super quick, the channel's growth hasn't shown any signs of slowing down, and I just want to take the time to thank all of you for making that happen. I keep getting comments from people telling me that they can't believe the channel is so small and that I deserve a way bigger following, and that really means a lot to me. I pinned a comment of mine on a few of my uploads reaching out to you guys about how I recently hit 500 subs. And as I'm talking to you right now, I'm watching my subs go over 600. Despite our community still being really small, I thought it would be fun if we did a Q&A video to celebrate so we could all get a chance to learn a little bit more about each other. I'm going to pin my comment again for this video. So if you have any questions at all about the channel or me specifically, just reply to that comment and I'll grab as many of them as I can for the Q&A. Thanks again for all the support. Next up on the docket, let's refresh ourselves on the world building for this series, because I remember this one being a bit dense. If you want a full understanding of the lore, you might want to go back and watch the original video, because there's going to be a lot of atmosphere that's going to get lost here. All of our stories take place across the land of the Orbitus Plateau, which, for all intents and purposes, is basically the whole world. Far under the ground run ley lines of arcane energy that intersect at a location known as the Grid. A long time ago, a group of people put down a mining outpost to gather any runoff that might be produced by the grid, and quickly began the process of developing a means of dispersing this new energy source to the rest of the world. People flocked to the outpost until it grew into what it is today, the massive coastal city of Teleterra, the last standing safe haven across the plateau. A few of the founding members of this settlement went on to create Vault, the virtual archive of linking technology, a corporation at the forefront of communication and information storage. They used the success of their company to eventually buy out the other founders and took complete control of Teleterra. In the last decade or so, Vault saw an opportunity to gain a profit and created the Tether. All the energy mined from the Earth travels through this machine, where Vault can then use it to throttle the transfer of energy to the plateau. If you wanted to benefit from this source of power, you would have to live on their land, pay their taxes, and adhere to their laws. Many disagreed with what Vault was doing, but Teleterra was theirs, and so was the Grid, and they were no longer willing to have this endless resource handed out for free. War came to the Orbitus Plateau, but it was short-lived. Vault soldiers were well-funded and well-armed, and the resistance was mostly common people. Many were forced to either join Vault and agree to their rules, or be banished into the Wildlands. On a normal day in Teleterra, you'll find citizens talking about how Vault made all of this possible. But opinions change pretty quickly behind closed doors or out of sight of vault enforcers. Missing people, private information sold to the highest bidder, opinion, speech, even thought, all being policed. There's definitely a darker side to Teleterra that some are unlucky enough to witness, and it all stems from the team sitting at the top of Vault Tower. Gus Johnson, Ranger and Fighter the Orbitus Plateau is littered with large forts and structures left behind by lost civilizations. And just below the surface runs a labyrinth of tunnels, caverns created by wildlife or dungeons carved out to hold ancient power. Many of these locations have been lost to dangerous animals, otherworldly monstrosities, and endless ranks of bandits and outlaws. In hopes of re-establishing outposts in these areas, smaller settlements will hire capable travelers to clear these structures, usually giving a bonus if done quickly or efficiently. One of the best people in this field of work is the famous dungeon delver, Gus Johnson. Word around the tavern is that Gus grew up in a more rural town outside of the walls of Teleterra, 
where you have no choice but to learn how to live off the land and are tasked with keeping yourself alive at a young age. This makes him a decent tracker and a skilled hunter. Teleterra is full of magic and newly discovered science. Gus may owe his current long and prosperous life to one said art, alchemy. He has an increasingly long list of recipes and can craft, brew, or concoct any myriad of potions or poisons. Not only does he clear many deadly pits and caverns, but for some landmarks, he will take more than simple payment, always pushing himself to do better and take more risks, competing and betting with friends to see who can clear dungeons the fastest. To see a Gus Johnson in the zone chugging brews and clearing a labyrinth is the height of witnessing a true citizen of the plateau. The Paul Brothers. Logan, Fighter, Jake, Barbarian. Vault claims their strict attitude and use of an iron fist is to protect the people of Teleterra. It guarantees that the law is followed and order is kept. Vault achieves this end with enforcers, high-ranking officers that patrol the streets and keep criminals in check. Many enforcers' identities are kept anonymous, but occasionally members of the community grab the attention of Vault and are given a position. These enforcers, whether a PR move or a political one, are a public face. But where Mark Fishbach was given the title of enforcer to keep Vault in good standing with the public, the Paul brothers were brought in to keep people in line. These two enforcers don't simply get away with breaking laws and committing acts of violence and terror. They're given a license to dispense a very specific brand of Vault justice, something that can come from these enforcers in many different forms, none of which are good. If you do happen to find yourself in the path of these brothers, keep quiet, hold your breath, don't let their eyes focus on you, and pray that if they do approach you, you get the lesser of two evils. Logan may push the limits of what some decent folk consider unnecessary aggression or even enforcer brutality, but you'll be thankful it wasn't his brother. Vault does their best to keep them under control. It rarely works, but in their eyes, the results the brothers bring to the table far outweigh the collateral damage they cause to the populace and to Teleterra as a whole. Jeffrey Star, Sorcerer and Artificer People who are willing to take the risk, or those who don't truly understand the risk they're taking, move out to the wildlands. Due to a lack of vault influence, Many seek a sort of freedom outside of the walls, a place to find their fortune. Black markets and literal underground trading rings pop up here and there scattered across the lawless hellscape, willing to sell rare and outlawed commodities for mountains of coin. There are few who find true power and success at such a dangerous enterprise. One such successful merchant is Jeffrey Star, the Star Prince, the Blood Diamond, Merchant King of the Badlands. Legend has it he started as a lowly serf, taking whatever jobs he could find, and often grasping at straws to make his way to the upper-class aristocracy of Teleterra. They rejected his attempts, so he set a new path, one where he didn't have to play the games of the rich and powerful. Seemingly overnight, he gained contacts that would help fund his new empire. He was now in control, and soon, Everyone would clamor to his shops to buy anything their hearts desired, as long as they had enough coin. If other merchants hesitated or were afraid of vault retribution, Star was not, and profited highly from his fearlessness, often at others' expense. Many partnerships with the Blood Diamond have ended in just that, blood. People believe due to his cutthroat way of doing business he's untrustworthy, but when it comes to his work, he is nothing of the sort. Everyone is held to their word, including himself. An otherworldly, almost fae-like stickler for the absolute word of a contract. In an attempt to gain more riches than any other living being on the plateau, Star has crossed paths with Vault on more than one occasion. He flaunts his wealth and lifestyle in their face, even referring to his dragon-like hoard of riches as his Vault selling them things that even they can't get their hands on. Combine that with the fact that his personal guard is made up of ex-enforcers and some of the most dangerous people living outside of Teleterra's walls, and Star has this air of being untouchable to any merchants who wish to take his place.
Matthew Mercer, wizard and fighter. Deep in the forest, there sits a modest tavern. Because of its location, it lends itself perfectly to wary travelers from all over the plateau who need a place to rest from the dangers of the wildlands. Seasoned veterans come here to trade in tales and swap stories of their deeds. Matthew Mercer is one such weaver, a man whose gift of storytelling is as natural as breathing. It's not uncommon to throw open the great oak doors to little noise but the main hearth and bated breath as men and women of all backgrounds sit in awe as Mercer weaves his magic. Dunamancy, to be precise. An arcane art that allows him to recreate time and events as if watching a theater performance play out there on the bar top. Grand illusions, insane details, and from the man himself, voices and personalities for every character. Those lucky enough to have seen this argue whether the tales are all his. It seems like too much information for someone to be making up off the top of their head. But the way that Mercer tells these stories, it seems as if he's recalling something from his past. But he would have had to have lived a hundred lifetimes and come back from the dead to be any of the characters from his stories, right? And that in itself would be its own story to be spun. So how do you guys think I did? I'm pretty happy with these. I'm seeing a huge improvement from last episode. Are you guys interested in seeing me continue this series? What YouTubers do you think I should cover next? Let me know in the comments below. I'll be starting the Q&A video in a few days, and then after that's all wrapped up, I'll be finalizing new Pokemon designs for my next upload. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe. It really helps me out. If you want to take a crack at drawing any of the prompts I've done, or if you want to send me some artwork to help flesh out some of my worlds, please send them to me over on my Twitter. I'd love to see what you guys make. But until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.